confirm that you're able to hear us well in the room? Thank you very much. to welcome you all to this event. Um, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I just want to thank Oksana and the entire program committee for putting together this really stimulating program and really looking for this day. I will let Oksana introduce the event. Thank you very much. A quick um, hello and uh, thank you from my side. I'll just take the next two or three minutes to uh, make sure we credit all the persons who have contributed to this event. Uh, first of all, thank you all for making it to this room because I know there were quite a few issues. I was still troubleshooting till uh, last minute. Um, in terms of links and receiving uh, the right um, access to, uh, to the platform, I know this, this has been uh, quite difficult, but I'm, uh, I'm very grateful that you, you all made it here and that you're also supporting others to, to get uh, to the room. Like with all events of this size, it takes uh, a whole team to make it happen. And at GigaNet, as most of you know, we have a rather small team in place. Therefore, I'd like to, to thank the steering committee and the program committee for all their work on preparing this program since uh, March this year. There have been many months of uh, intense uh, support going through the whole process of selecting the abstract all the way to uh, finalizing the program. It is the very first time we are organizing a hybrid event at the IDF. And despite all the lessons uh, we learned during the pandemic, I can tell you it was quite a challenge. Uh, what we are doing for today is uh, fully hybrid. So we're not just uh, running sessions online, but we're also having uh, a presence in situ and all our prayers and discussions are connecting from um, Addis. Uh, with the exception of uh, Dimitri, who will be joining at the discussion for the very last panel. Therefore, special thanks are also due to our colleagues present on site, Yves Chan Chin, who is ensuring that everything is uh, running smoothly and she's also our contact person um, on the ground. If uh, you know people who might want to join throughout the day and are attending the IDF, uh, please make sure they, uh, they get in touch with her so they can get all the information needed over there. Last but not least, our author's contributions are much awaited and we're very thankful for that. 
Um, they are coming from different continents, five in total, and they have been very kind to work with us on uh, the time zone differences and uh, to make this happen. I mean, some of them are connecting in the middle of the night, others really early in the morning, and we're very, very grateful for, um, for their time and participation. The research is innovative and provoking, and most importantly, it is policy relevant. As you'll see from the program, all the papers discussed uh, deal with current issues, and we are hoping this will feed into other conversations at the IDF. We're planning to continue our collaboration with the Telecommunications Policy Journal, and um, we're hoping we can have another special issue out um, after this event. At the end of the day, we will be starting uh, the thinking process around what might fit together thematically for uh, our next special issue. We will have uh, completed already two special issues by, uh, by the time uh, this event is over. We have one in 2020, another one from contributions from last year is uh, due to come out uh, early next year. Uh, so we're hoping this um, third year of collaboration with TP would, um, would be even smoother than, uh, than in the past. What we are uh, enabling with this um, is access to this research for a much wider audience. Uh, we know there is a community around the IDF and around GigaNet in particular, but we, we want to make this cutting edge research available to many more people. And we're also trying to make that open access whenever possible. Our authors, chairs, and discussants come from very different continents, and uh, we are very, very excited to see this event uh, coming together. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to um, Chan and Sai, to Alison, who will be chairing the first uh, panel, and wish you all a fruitful discussion. It's really great to see it happening. Thank you. We don't seem to have sound from the room. Sorry, there's still no sound uh, online. It's online, no sounds online. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me online? Uh, Roxana, can you confirm if you can hear me online? Ah, good. Thank you 
so much. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's really absolutely wonderful to be holding uh, GigaNet and IGF in, in Africa and in Ethiopia. It's um, been a long journey trying to get uh, greater particip participation from the Global South and um, to have an audience in front of us of mainly Africans is just really a wonderful experience for me. I'm the former deputy chair of the um, GigaNet and we've really tried very hard and not always successfully to extend our membership um, to the Global South. So wonderful that you're here and let's begin the, the, the first session. Um, which is, uh, uh, the, s the session is uh, um, called The Contested Governance of Digital Infrastructure. If you've had a chance to look at the papers which are online, the papers you will see appear to be much broader than um, digital infrastructure. And I think this is an interesting policy debate um, in that many of these papers are actually looking more at dig data infrastructure. Um, and just to bring some of our own experience um, in the African context, We've recently been involved and the African Union has um, pre prepared a data policy framework um, for, for Africa. And uh, there was considerable debate in this discussion in, in the paper, uh, in the preparation of the paper around you know, what constitutes digital and what constitutes data um, infrastructure because in the literature, I think there are quite um, di important distinctions made. Um, so I think this is really a nice opportunity to take our policy research um, to, to policy practice and, and, and um, bring these, the information from these really wonderful papers and the analysis from these very wonderful papers um, uh, to particular contexts that, that this is developing in. Um, I think another thing that's quite distinctive about um, the data policy framework is that it, unlike many of the other data policy frameworks that are emerging and that have emerged um, in, U in Europe and the North, is that there's enormous emphasis on the need for this foundational infrastructure. And I think we've had discussions within GigaNet before about where internet governance stops and starts. Um, and there's been kind of different views on to what degree we should be looking um, at uh, you know, foundational infrastructure. So I think this is a really important session, particularly in the context of Africa, but more generally because I think, you know, many countries across the world now are facing similar data infrastructure problems. But I think one of the main distinctions that we see in these papers is that digital infrastructure, which some of the uh, first two papers really deal with, um, are talking about you know, satellites and, and hard infrastructure, um, old digital infrastructure, not new in digital infrastructure. Whereas some of the other papers are more using a, a data infrastructure analysis, which includes um, physical infrastructure, but also speaks about the necessary institutional um, enabling environment that you need, the institutional um, infrastructure that you need in, in a data environment. So you'll see the papers go um, far more broadly than, um, than you know, just digital infrastructure, if that's people's understanding of it. We've got um, five wonderful papers. Um, the first is by Stephanie Arnold of the University of Bologna on development aid and fiber optic network providers. She looks um, at China, the World Bank, and, um, um, and the IT sec ITC sector in Africa and compares the um, development investments and the outcomes and the politics really, or the geopolitics of these in investments. The second paper that we'll look at is what we owe each other, um, which is looking at equitable access to secure affordable and reliable Leo broadband satellite services. This paper is by Werner um, Akali Gur from um, Queen Mary University of London and Joanna Kulesa from the University of Oxford. The, the, the other next paper that we've got, I'm afraid, I don't think we had an online paper, um, Roxana, but it's on power plays, industrial strategy, and the appropriation of open software in the making of open RAN, the case of ja the Japanese industry in 5G standardization, um, Ricardo Nani. Um, I think this paper you know, is <laughs> very pertinent in terms of the geopolitical issues that are happening around this, but unfortunately we've not um, had a copy of that online. The other paper really goes to some of these issues that I was discussing around data infrastructure where it's looking at encoding privacy and it looks specifically at tech workers as co-regulators in data protection regulation. It's looking particularly at um, uh, shifting some of the, um, um, social from the, the, the analysis of this in, in a more social context of compliance to a context of, of a more transparent knowability um, you know, achievability regime so that you look at um, uh, regulation and enforcement 
in, in that environment rather than in a compliance environment that can often not be, be met. So a very interesting paper there. And then we've got the final paper um, on AI politics and sanctions, comparing the case of Russia and Iran. And we're very fortunate to have in the room um, Radomir Bolgov and Olga Filtova from St. Petersburg University. So they'll present um, here in person. Um, and so we've already started a bit late and taken up some time. We also have with us um, uh, Wolfgang Kleinwachter from the University of Alfred. So um, he will um, have a short discussion um, period after the discussants. We'll take the discussants' responses to, to um, Wolfgang, and then we'll take a question and answer session, and then all of you can participate in the question and answer session, including, um, including uh, um, Wolfgang. The presenters have eight minutes each to present. If you could try and keep to that time, please. Um, the discussant will have 10 minutes to, to uh, discuss all those papers, which be a bit of a challenge. Um, and then we'll give it a, a short opportunity, a sort of two or three minute response to the discussants, uh, to the paper presenters, to the discussant. And then we'll hopefully have lots of questions from the floor and a lot of engagement from the floor. It's wonderful to see you all behind the pillar, but you might like to just come around this way so that you um, can join in the conversation and you don't have to look around the pillar. Um, so with that, we'll start with the first present, uh, with the first paper, um, which is online. Daphne, if you'd please present. All hear me? Yes, very loudly. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's great. great. Um, um, could you kindly you enable, enable uh, screen sharing? sharing? So I can just share my slides. I've prepared some, some slides. Stephanie, I'm not sure we're going to um, get that. I also see it. Um, uh, deactivated for me. Uh, may I ask you to just go ahead, and we'll we'll try to follow. And if they fix it, meanwhile, I'll uh, I'll let you know. Yes, yes, yes. Well, in that case, I would just suggest um, for those who can't access my paper online, because I will talk about some geospatial maps, and it's going to be difficult to imagine what they look like if, if you don't if you don't see them. But uh, let me just um, start. So my name is Stephanie Arnold, and thank you so much for, for having me. It's my first time at uh, Giganet at the um, IGF. So um, it's really uh, it's really good to be here. Um, I will talk about fiber optic network providers and development aid, and how well China, the World Bank, and the ICT sector in Africa are somehow connected. So um, you might wonder, what do fiber optic network providers have to do with development aid? And I'm arguing they have to do quite a lot um, together because in developing countries, um, many developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, they rely on foreign infrastructure. Um, so they must collaborate with the foreign network equipment providers um, to get the backbone infrastructure. Um, but then they also have to uh, somehow look for finance abroad because usually they don't have the internal resources to pay for this expensive uh, kit. And that's where the development aid inflows uh, come in. And um, once we talk about development aid inflows, we of course must also look at uh, donor uh, policies. Um, donor policies um, in terms of digital development, for example. And there we have different approaches. Um, so when we think about digital development from a Western perspective, I think all of us um, know about the ICT for Youth paradigm, the ICT for Development paradigm that has been around since the mid-1990s, um, that has been incorporated in the Millennium Development Goals, later in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And um, the whole uh, idea is constructed around a human-centered approach that aims at achieving universal internet access. Um, the way how the West thinks to achieve this is by implementing, implementing strategic plans, um, concrete, policy, uh, uh, concrete policies, concrete action plans, um, and these are supposed to set out, um, for example, um, how to achieve more digital literacy, um, how to uh, construct the backbone infrastructure, how to create a sustainable regulatory framework, and so on. 
By contrast, um, if we look at the Chinese approach, for example, so China, we know, is much a much more recent player in the development landscape and actually uh, a developing country itself. Um, China often puts its national interest and strategic priorities first. Um, when it comes to ICT infrastructure and um, new technologies in general, um, we know that China actually has um, big overcapacity, domestic overcapacity in the production of these uh, infrastructures. And one way to cope with this um, is to go global, actually. So um, Beijing encourages its uh, companies to um, make investments abroad. It has devised the Digital Silk Road, for example, which complements the Belt and Road Initiative. And it is really aimed at um, uh, expanding um, Chinese-built uh, ICT infrastructure um, around the world, um, where China stays at the center, in a way. Um, and the way they do this um, is through a quite specific scheme, the so-called EPC plus F scheme. Um, EPC plus F stands for uh, Engineering, Procurement and uh, Construction, plus Finance. And this plus Finance is really, is really key. And it is really what sets the Chinese strategy apart from many, many others. Um, because if we imagine, for example, Ericsson um, coming into um, an African country and wanting to build um, the, the uh, fiber optic network, um, the client government uh, usually has to find the financing. So they have to come up with, with the money to pay for it. But um, if we talk about Huawei or ZTE, um, oftentimes the Chinese state can provide uh, state uh, State back money uh, through its uh, policy banks or other um, or other channels, um, and they can advance the payment for it in terms of a loan or maybe um, an aid-like payment. Um, but upon the condition that the, the infrastructure provider is going to be uh, Chinese, uh, and this is what constructs a very strong, a very strong bond. And this is how China somehow promotes um, digital development, but only through its own uh, companies, as opposed to the West, which has an arguably more, more open uh, strategy. Um, now, the research question that emerges from this landscape um, is whether these different approaches uh, to digital development affect the ICT infrastructure provider landscape in sub-Saharan Africa. So what are the consequences of these two different approaches? And what I did is I uh, collected open access data um, that was made available by um, After Fiber and A Data, and I complemented it with uh, news articles to, um, uh, yeah, just add the information that I could not find in the uh, databases themselves. Um, and then I plotted uh, geospatial maps, um, as I mentioned earlier. So um, I hope all of you are able to to see the maps from um, from the uh, paper at least. So. Um, you can see that um, in Western Africa and along the Western coast of uh, Central and Southern Africa, um, most of the uh, fiber uh, optic cables are um, red, and red in this case stands for um, Huawei. So uh, Huawei built most of the cables there, and then in South, uh, in, uh, in South Africa, sorry, and in Zambia, as well as um, in uh, Ethiopia, uh, you can see that many uh, of the, of, uh, most cables were built by ZTE. So overall, we have about 70% of the cables in Africa that were built by, um, by China or like a Chinese uh, provider. Um, if we look, uh, if, com if we compare this phenomenon with uh, the uh, aid inflows, for example, uh, from the World Bank, which is one of the major infrastructure lenders or, um, or sponsors in Africa, um, we see that most of the development the aid from the World Bank has gone to Western Africa and Eastern Africa. Um, but it's not, but not so much has gone to the western coast, of like central and southern Africa. Also because it is. Um,
Thank you so much, Stephanie. Sorry, that's Thank very loud. <laughs> Stephanie, um, unfortunately, I think we didn't get to see your wonderful maps. So perhaps if you could just be ready, you can share your screen now. Um, when um, Volkang is discussant, perhaps you can just be ready to put up your, your maps again, because I think they are very um, helpful with your analysis. Um, and then as the next speaker speaks now, they'll start sharing their screen. So don't do it right now, do it when we come back to the discussion. But thank you for a very, very interesting input. And just to confirm that all the um, lead speakers or the um, first authors have been made co-hosts. Okay, so um, Berna Akli Gur, are you ready to present? Would you like to share your screen or are you just going to talk? Ah, there we are. We can see you but not hear you at the moment. Let's just get, make sure we can hear you. Okay. We can hear you now. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm not Berna, I'm Joanna. I'm the second co-author. We agreed with Berna for me to present today and hope that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, I will not be able to share my screen if I should be giving admin rights. I do have a few Joanna, Joanna, sorry, Joanna, just so that you can do your presentation and just so that we can move on so we don't lose time. I'm going to move on because um, the, the first author got, has she got now? Okay, you, you've got, you can share. Please go ahead. Yes, we can. Yes, they have.
Jana, Jana, sorry, yes. you just broke up. If you could just go back to your point on privacy and data protection, that's where we lost you. Joanna, I'm afraid we've run over. Thank you so much for such an interesting paper. Hopefully we'll come back to this in question time and in the, in the discussion we certainly will. So if we could move on to the um, next paper, please. Um, do we have Riccardo Nani of uh, Fondazione Kessler? Yes, Ricardo, we can, but you're a little soft. We're going to just get your volume up. I'll try my best. No, you're, you're fine. We'll do it this side. And uh, we, can, we can hear you now, so please go ahead. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, as a display, I present on...
Ricardo, could you just uh, Ricardo, could you just hold for a moment because you've s broken up? All right, you seem to be back. Thank you. Yes, we can. This just if you could start with this slide. We heard you up until now. Yes, we we l just lost you on the next slide.
Thank you very much, um, Ricardo. We look forward to that paper. Um, very nice historical account of, of uh, the development of the standardization of the um, form 5D or form 5D. Um, we're now going to go straight on to the paper by Rohan Grover um, on encoding privacy, tech workers as co-regulators in data protection regulation. Um, Rohan, if you could please take over. You should be able to now. I think Ricardo is sort of still sharing his screen. I think so. Okay. Let's just, we're just checking that. Could you just check it again? Ricardo, do you mind if we go straight on to Vladimir and Olga, who are here, and then we'll come back to you so that you can do your presentation? Oh, All right, good. There we go.
Thank you very much, Ricardo, and for trying to be on time. Um, I think we're very close close to that. Um, finally, we just have to um, uh, keep presenters in the room. Vladimir and Olga, would you like to come up and present your paper on AI politics and sanctions, comparing the case of Russia and the United States? Dear colleagues, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this paper uh, written by me and uh, Olga Filatova. Um, uh, our paper is about uh, artificial intelligence uh, policies and strategies uh, by countries, uh, conducted by countries uh, which are uh, under sanctions uh, uh, now, uh, Russia and Iran. So, uh, we know that uh, um, uh, that uh, at the moment uh, leading powers uh, and uh, many countries uh, are moving towards uh, uh, modernization through new technologies including uh, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, it's uh, strategically necessary for uh, for the development of countries, and the purpose is to identify similarities and differences in the uh, AI policies uh, of the states which claim for the uh, influence uh, global in Russian case and regional in uh, Iranian case, and. Uh, uh, as for the scope of our uh, studies, so we analyze the legislation and uh, strategic documents, uh, policy papers, uh, as well as uh, institutions and uh, practices. Uh, uh, so uh, we compare um, these uh, policies uh, according to the such parameters uh, as uh, development goals in the field of artificial intelligence uh, authorities responsible for uh, this project's uh, implementation uh, priorities uh, and position in the global rankings such as uh, uh, government uh, AI readiness, uh, nature index, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, global AI index, uh, but for plus media. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, uh, we um, selected these cases uh, because uh, this is uh, two global two countries which uh, occupy two top positions in terms of number of restrictions imposed against the countries. Um, we must mention that uh, there uh, shouldn't uh, direct parallels. Um, at the same time, uh, there are uh, some similar features of these cases. Uh, for example, um, uh, the countries uh, try to uh, claim for uh, influence, take challenge, uh, so-called uh, so uh, Western world order. Uh, uh, in both countries, uh, the assets of central banks are blocked. Uh, almost all the brands uh, of Western countries lift uh, Iran and Russia as officially SWIFT doesn't work, uh, uh, the countries are the uh, greatest oil suppliers and uh, so uh, this uh, oil um, of these countries are under sanctions as well, so um, 
so uh, it uh, uh, get, uh, makes not possible to uh, to to get uh, foreign technologies for the development uh, of artif artificial intelligence uh, because there are no uh, exchange uh, uh, exchange uh, possibilities uh, and our links uh, internet is filtered etc uh, etc et at the same time uh, the, uh, the situation is not uh, fully similar because uh, iran is a theor theocratic state which is led by uh, ayatollah religious leader uh, unlike uh, in russia uh, uh, the introduction of uh, sanctions uh, in russia was uh, uh, was uh, sh shocking uh, it was uh, uh, it was made at the same time uh, a lot of sanctions but uh, the sanctions uh, against iran was uh, were uh, ha has been introducing uh, during uh, 40 years long um, so uh, next slide please As for uh, the strategies, um, in Russian case, uh, we can uh, we managed to find 11 artificial policy initiatives, and uh, they are listed in this slide. Uh, uh, the institutions uh, are listed as well, uh, and uh, I will. Uh, not uh, pay uh, much time for this. Uh, you can see this in uh, my presentation and in my paper. Uh, so uh, next slide. Uh, uh, and uh, the sanctions uh, uh, forced the government to search for technological sovereignty and uh, the principles uh, declared by uh, the government uh, of this uh, technological sovereignty are listed here. So uh, this is uh, uh, this means uh, that uh, um, uh, the government, the country, uh, must uh, have its own basis platforms which are provided with their own software, hardware, and technologies that are not uh, completely dependent on uh, the uh, corporation and countries uh, legislation is flexible and nuancedly regulates online uh, and no country should be able to censor and moderate someone else's space based on uh, on own vision uh, as declared uh, please next slide uh, uh, next slide so, um, at the same time, there are uh, the problems uh, because uh, share uh, the percentages of researchers and developers uh, uh, is uh, much uh, less than, for example, in China, uh, which takes uh, leading positions in the field of artificial intelligence uh, now. Uh, spending on science is a little more than 1% of GDP. Um, many IT products are uh, purchased from Asian countries uh, and based on the technologies of foreign companies uh, which can uh, that can uh, limit exports and impose anti-Russian secondary sanctions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as for the Iranian strategies, so um, uh, 12 years ago, Ayatollah Khamenei declared uh, uh, inter uh, introduction of uh, resistance economy. Uh, and uh, now uh, uh, Iran is oriented on the uh, Chinese technologies. Uh, um, Iran uh, supply energy sources and uh, uh, Iran sold uh, energy sources and uh, supplies uh, computers, chips from China. Uh, 
Iran uh, legalized uh, cryptocurrency. It uh, uh, seems uh, by the government as a way to uh, to avoid sanctions uh, in the field of money exchange and uh, blocking uh, SWIFT systems and Iranian uh, uh, currency systems, etc. Uh, Iran developed uh, many uh, national applications uh, for uh, geospatial uh, uh, in the field of uh, uh, looks like Uber, for example, Snap Tehran, uh, etc. Uh, it's a fifth larger uh, produ producer of uh, STEM graduates. Uh, there are many uh, researchers who study artificial intelligence in Iran, and we talk about the military artificial intelligence. Iran is a, a big producer of uh, drones uh, and other automatic uh, machine guns. Uh, next slide. Uh, here uh, we try to compare uh, the positions in the rankings and uh, you can see that uh, China uh, and the United States have uh, much uh, higher positions than Iran and Russia. Uh, so, um, next slide. Uh, yes, I will conclude uh, right now. Uh, and uh, the last slide, please. Uh, uh, so we conclude that uh, um, at the moment Russia and uh, Iran are not, are not leaders in this field. Uh, there are some uh, basic uh, um, uh, attempts to develop uh, uh, artificial intelligence policies and uh, uh, institutions, uh, but uh, uh, at the moment uh, there is uh, no uh, uh, clear vision in these countries uh, how to develop in the light of sanctions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's uh, such a rich paper. I urge you to, to read it. It's absolutely fascinating um, assessment um, of uh, Russian and um, Iranian well, kind of geopolitics of it, actually. Um, Wolfgang, could I ask you to please um, continue with the discussion? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really impressed by all the five papers. And as the person who organized the Kickstart meeting for GigaNet in July 2006 in the small village of Raden in Germany with the help of UNESCO, the International Association for Media and Communication Research, IMCR, and the International Communication Association, ICA. Uh, it's really incredible to see how this crazy idea in from 2006 to establish an academic network to deal with internet governance has evolved over the years. And I can only congratulate the new generation of leaders in GigaNet that they have develop this idea and really to uh, have now, that we have now a global academic network which produces excellent papers which hopefully will uh, have its effect influence uh, decision makers and help us to understand uh, the world better. Uh, you know, when I compare the situation which was described in the papers of today with the situation we had nearly 20 years ago, I see uh, a really an interesting shift. And uh, while the five papers they are rather different, but from one perspective, they are rather similar because they demonstrate that in the last 20 years, the world has changed. 20 years ago, it was mainly a battle about the domain name system, IP addresses, and the uh, control over the root server and it was bridging the digital divide. But today we have seen, you know, the battlefield has changed. It has become more pulled into the bigger geostrategic battles between United States and China and other uh, global and regional 
uh, powerhouses and it has moved to issues like uh, infrastructure, like satellites, like AI and standardization. So uh, this doesn't mean that the uh, domain name system, root servers, IP addresses uh, are unimportant. They are still the basis for all the developments we have on the application layer. But uh, what I have seen in the last years, fortunately, the uh, battle between ICANN and ITU about who controls the DNS and the root servers is over. I have learned also this from the recent plenipotentiary conference of the ITU in Bucharest, where I was a member of the German delegation. So this is over, but that doesn't mean that the battle is over. But the battle has moved to other spaces. And in so far, you know, I, I'm really impressed about the details and the facts and the data which was uh, uh, presented uh, by the five papers we had here. So Stephanie's paper was really interesting to see that the African continent becomes now a battlefield between China and she said the World Bank, but you could say it's the G7 with the big uh, uh, build uh, back better initiative uh, versus the, the, the uh, 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 digital Silk Road um, initiative of China. And I think that's important what we can learn also from the presentation. That's a challenge, a wake up call for Africa. Uh, here, um, um, Addis is the headquarter of the African Union. The African Union has uh, adopted last year a strategy, Digital Africa 2030, for digital transformation. And I think this paper uh, should be used by African researchers to make clear that Africa should not be, become the object of global uh, battles between <laughs> powerhouses, but become the subject of this development. So they should develop cooperation both with China and uh, the G7. So, but the, the, the own interests of Africa should have uh, priority. I think Joanna's paper and, uh, has also put the, 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 the focus on uh, some issues. You know, 20 years ago, we celebrated the multi-stakeholderism as a big achievement. So, and we said, okay, the internet is too complex that it can be managed by one stakeholder group alone. So if we leave it in the hand of governments, this will be one-sided. If we leave it in the hand of the private sector, this will be one-sided. So all stakeholders have, have to have a say in management of the internet governance. But with, uh, let's say, new technologies, new infrastructure, so it gets even more complex, as uh, Jonah's paper has said, you know, with the LEO satellites and other types of broadband satellite. And we have new risks now. Well, on the one hand, the complexity of the multi-stakeholder model, uh, you know, has also its weaknesses. And you, it's time consuming. It's frustrating if all stakeholders, you know, bring their perspectives. But <laughs> to, to have sustainable results, you need them. Otherwise, you know, uh, these policies can be captured. And when Jonas um, said, you know, there is a risk that now Elon Musk will capture uh, so the policy making in LEO satellites, you know, uh, that we move to private governance of the internet. So this is a risk and we have to come back to the original justification for the multi-stakeholder model, but it means the stakeholders have to do their homework. So that means we have to improve the multi-stakeholder model. We have to enhance it. We have the definition from the Tunis Agenda. We have the principles from the Net Mundial Declaration from 2014. So time is ripe now to develop more procedures. And, and you know, the, the, the model will work. And probably the discussion on the Global Digital Compact, which will be also take place here in the IGF in, in, in Addis Abeba and the tech envoy uh, Amadip is here in, in Ethiopia and is responsible for the Global Digital Compact which will be uh, hopefully uh, adopted in uh, as part of the UN Summit on the Future in the year 2024. So that's now the time to uh, enhance the multi-stakeholder model. And I think Jonah was, was very clear that we have to raise awareness 
that the weaknesses of the multi-stakeholder model does not mean that the multi-stakeholder model is bad and can be substituted or captured uh, by governments or by the private sector, but we have to be proactive and academics have to play an important role in, 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 elabor uh, in elaborating this. Ricardo's paper has also impressed me because he put the finger on another area of conflict, so new area of conflict, and this is standardization. So I think the terminology standardization war is already very familiar for people active in this field, but we have moved now you know, to a new level of standards. It's not only the standards which are uh, traditionally internet standards uh, done by the IETF, so if it comes to all this uh, new uh, 5G uh, uh, standards and, and, and others, uh, we see this uh, really is um, a battle about markets and not only about markets but also about policies and ideologies uh, be behind the policies. So, and uh, the, uh, it was interesting to see that uh, last year when the United Kingdom had the presidency of the G7, that uh, the digital ministers of the G7 uh, started a project and said, you know, we have to look deeper into the implications of standardization. And here the question is, is standardization done in, in the governmental environment, like in the ITU, ITUT? Is it done by the, uh, um, let's say, more private uh, standardization bodies like the IETF or IEEE or uh, others? So these are important issues, and he raised an interesting issue uh, with regard to Japan of uh, techno-nationalism, so that because some countries are looking behind, are looking, trying to broaden their influence while pushing for certain standards. And this is very risky because if we go uh, uh, into a direction that every country says, my country first, so it started with Mr. Trump um, six years ago, America first, but if I travel around now, I see it's China first, it's Russia first, it's India first, it's Brazil first. So uh, this can contribute to the fragmentation of the internet, to the splinter net, and then this one world, one internet will be history. So I think that's important, and this will be decided via standards. If we have <laughs> a fragmentation in the standards, this is, uh, uh, will fire back to everybody. So that means everybody has to pay a price for a fragmented, uh, 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 for fragmented standards. We need global standards to enable communication. Uh, and uh, in so far, it was also interesting when Rohan raised the question and compared the GDPR with the CCPA in California and asked the question, what are the consequences for the rest of the world? Um, India, he did not mention China. So, and he did not mention the idea which was is discussed in the United Nations, do we need <laughs> a global instrument for privacy protection, data protection. So it's discussed in the um, uh, Human Rights Council, so we have a special rapporteur uh, on privacy uh, in, in, in the digital age. Uh, so, but this is uh, uh, really a big challenge, and in, in, in my eyes he raised also indirectly an important point, and this is the cooperation between code makers and lawmakers. He lamented that the regulation is very vague in, in many things and developers have no clue, you know, what to do with the regulation. And then they maneuver and trying, you know, to say, okay, we have to be compliant, but uh, let's find a way and, 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 and we are moving forward. So the way forward is really to bring the collaboration between code makers and lawmakers to a new level. So that they work hand in hand in developing the products and you know, working together with the manufacturers and working together with policymakers. And uh, the final paper uh, from uh, Radomir and Olga is also interesting because AI is the battlefield of the, of the future. Everybody knows this. And uh, different countries are now working on different kinds of regulation or framing it. So we have the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI. 
uh, the European Commission has started uh, to regulate AI with an AI package. The Council of Europe is working in an AI uh, convention. And uh, so we, the US has just recently adopted a Bill of AI Rights, uh, which is also more a policy framework, so it's difficult to find it. And it was very interesting to see what Russia and Iran is doing. And so <coughs> this is the next battlefield. And uh, Radomir mentioned at the end, uh, this has also very military uh, military implications when he mentioned the drones from Iran and others. So we have a negotiation channel on lesser autonomous weapon systems which are uh, uh, negotiating uh, protocol under the Convention on Conventional Weapons to try to regulate autonomous weapon systems, killer robots and all this. And the key question is how to bring the human in uh, loop uh, or the, not to delegate the issue of uh, life and death to an uh, automated weapon system. So this is really a very, very crucial question. And here we need more awareness and more engagement of academics so that they help to, uh, uh, that people understand that we are moving towards a very risky, uh, risky future. So, and uh, we cannot uh, avoid, and, and the AI is, is not only a future battlefield, it has a lot of benefits, but it has a lot of risks. And I think the uh, responsibility of academics and in particular also of GigaNet is to, to, to help uh, the broader public to understand the issue, to maximize the benefits and to minimize the risks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. And um, thank you so much for contextualizing these excellent papers. Um, not only in the context of um, GigaNet and the, the growth of GigaNet over these years, over the last two decades, but particularly in the international context as well, and the various developments in these various areas that you are so familiar with. Um, let's go immediately, because we are running a little bit late, to questions and answers from the floor, and then we'll also give you a chance to respond to those and to respond to Wolfgang's um, uh, uh, input or discussion for your different papers. So if those of you, your presenters are in as well, we'll go straight to questions and answers online and um, in the room. And we'll just start with questions um, in the room. Perhaps if you could just say your name and your organization quickly so we can get a sense of who you are. Okay, thank you everyone. My name is Warabile and I'm here on my personal capacity. <laughs> so my question is basically around I think uh, one paper from someone who spoke a little bit about the air surveillance, I think from yourself, Sam. Uh, I think it's actually time for us to kind of start demystifying the narratives of global power players within the digital uh, policy discourse, particularly that I had so many presenters here speak a lot about China being the major player uh, of digital infrastructure development globally. Uh, and linking them, I mean, linking to some of the Chinese companies, particularly Huawei, Hikvision. But I think what we need to recognize is the fact that China is not the only country supplying advanced technologies globally. Even Western domiciled companies are key drivers of these technologies, even in Africa. So perhaps uh, I was looking forward to some sort of a balanced analysis from the participants who are particularly to show us what other countries are also doing in other countries uh, by supplying these technologies. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Warabila. And I'm sure that Stephanie wants to answer that question because her analysis was very uh, meticulous in demonstrating the connections between investment and um, state-owned contracts in, in, those, uh, in China and the different case of, it, of Western um, in investments in Africa. So perhaps Stephanie can respond to that question while we just collect some more, think about that question, while we respond to some more questions from the room. Could you come forward so that we can, you can take the mic. Thanks, Rabia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Emmanuel Yeda is my name from uh, 
African Union. Uh, we talked about uh, policies in digital governance, yes. Uh, most of our organizations are just catching up with the, these policies. Like uh, how, which measures, for example, how secure is our data in the digital environment mainly? Ka, can the speaker give us some light on how secure our data can be in the digital space? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think I'll hand over to Roxana for some online questions. Well, we are almost uh, running out of time, so I think uh, we might uh, have to close the panel very soon. All right. All right. Let me Let quickly me give a chance to the panelists to respond. There was a question, I think, directly related uh, to Stephanie's paper. So perhaps she might like to share her screen. Um, if she'd like to respond to that question. And then if any of the other discussants, uh, if any of the other paper presenters would like to respond to the discussant, please also just ma raise your hand or I'll take questions from um, the, the people in the room, the presenters. Yes, well, thank you so much for this question. I'm really glad to bring it up. Stephanie, thank you so much. I think your maps are doomed because we still couldn't see them on the side. So I'll urge people to, people to look at your paper. Um, very interesting, detailed maps. Um, I'm now going to ask um, Radmir and Olga in the room if they want to respond to any of the comments very quickly before we go to the other online presenters. Uh, uh, what I need to do, uh, excuse me. Either if you'd like to respond to um, Wolfgang, or if you'd like to respond to the Ah, question. okay, thank you. Uh, th thank you f for your uh, very fruitful suggestions, uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, in future to uh, maybe um, uh, to, to co compare uh, these cases with uh, other countries uh, and uh, I think uh, the European practice uh, and uh, practice of uh, other international organizations will be uh, very useful and at the same time uh, the topic you have touched uh, about the um, ethics of uh, AI, it's uh, very um, uh, perspective topic uh, for the discussion uh, in the future and uh, we will focus on this uh, further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radomir. Um, Joanna, would you like to respond?
Thanks so much, Joanna. We might not get to further questions, so thank you very much for that. Rahan, perhaps you'd like to take the question particularly on data protection, although it didn't refer directly to your paper. Maybe just a general comment that you'd like to make in response to the discussant, to Wolfgang, and then if you'd like to respond to that question about data protection. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Rahan. Um, Ricardo, would you like to just respond? Thank you so much, um, Ricardo. Um, I think that's all we have from the uh, um, thing. Uh, just any further questions, either from the room or online, Roxana? Any further questions from the room? All right, I think that's it then. Thank you so much to the um, presenters very good papers. Please do have a closer look at them. They're all on the Giganet, Giganet website. Thank you very much to um, Professor Wolfgang Kleinwachter for the excellent um, contextualization of these papers in the global context and in the policy context. And um, please just to urge those of you who are members of, of Giganet, there is a business session at the end of the day, um, important decisions around the Giganet's future. So please um, do um, keep your eye on that because of this broken up hy hy um, hybrid session. Thank you so much all, to all of you for your participation. Okay, thank you all. And we will take a five minutes break and then we will move to the next section which is uh, on the diplomacy and uh, participation in the new age of the internet governance. Okay, so yeah, five minutes break. Thank you.
Sorry, we have a star. Okay. Okay, so we are uh, we will start our second uh, panel. So uh, the second panel, uh, I'm the chair of the second panel. So the second panel's title is uh, uh, is on the diplomacy and the participation in the new era of internet governance. So we have uh, five papers. Uh, the first one is from Natalia and uh, Diana from the United Nations University. Their paper is on the uh, agent of change, youth mental participation at the Internet Governance Forum. So, and the second paper is uh, uh, from uh, uh, four authors from Freelander, Kimberly, Maria, and uh, Hamanu. And uh, their paper is on the politics of citation, agenda analysis of the conference proceeding of the Internet Governance Research Network in Brazil. The third paper is from uh, Stephanie uh, from the University of Geneva and uh, paper is on the responsible behave in cyberspace, engaging the private sector through tightly diplomacy. So the four papers from Sophia, from United Nations University, Christ, and uh, the paper is on the roles in the digital space, symbolic uh, interaction is the role theory and the norms of sovereignty. So the last paper is from the Cassania and uh, Francisca, and their paper is actually is on the safe space by design, Fragrate architectures as alternative social technology model of content moderation governance. So in the end, we will have a discussions. Uh, the discussions is uh, is Adrian and uh, Fidalian, and uh, he is from the uh, Humanity in Actions. So each speaker has uh, eight minutes. And then we will have a uh, feedback from discussions. Then we will open the floor to the audience on site and live for the Q and A. Okay, should we uh, pass the time to the first speaker, Natalia and Diana? Thank you. You how you how.
youth. So I've given a little bit of more in depth and I'll briefly try to address the, the following questions by taking some simpler um, results. Um, if you want to go into more depth, please feel free to, to read our paper where we uh, go into more de uh, depth about the definition, but also from the upcoming examples. So in, in question two, we approach the IGF from two perspectives. The IGF is a convener in which mechanisms are built and maintained, and the IGF is an annual event in which recurrent activities are created or engaged with. So as an example, you can see with the uh, NRIs that there are youth initiatives uh, created. You can go through an application procedure to be able to create this space in which youth exists within uh, within a, a national or regional space. There are thematic intercessional work, and specifically the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance, or YCEIG, they created objectives which met to participate. Specifically, they aim to create spaces or to create um, um, an understanding of how they want to shape internet governance. But also recently in the expert group meeting, there was an acknowledgement uh, where there was a process to appoint a youth representative. And this was a very complex uh, uh, um, protocol, but aimed to create this inclusiveness. Then uh, the IGF is an annual event. Um, here we divide it in an IGF secretariat led, which is top down, but also stakeholder led, which is bottom up. We see that sessions are made by and for youth and um, creating sessions about their participation. So for example, there was a working group uh, on youth participation, youth participation, internet governance, where youth would reach out to stakeholders to ask them to add a youth perspective or to ask a youth, add a youth stakeholder to their panels. But also the IGF youth track was designed to bring a lot of people together from different cultures uh, and backgrounds from different ages to then decide a, a track for youth by youth. When you go to the stakeholder, let the section, you see that there are also youth and academic programs that have been created independent from the IGF to learn more about internet governance and create this space for youth to interact with each other, but also to empower them to then participate in these decision-making spaces. So in our last question, how are youth um, participating in these processes? Um, we saw that in these last two sections that youth have multiple entry points in which they can meta participate. They create spaces for themselves and other youth to participate. And we see that there are two separate tracks developing, the younger youth who create a separate space for discussions on youth issues and, uh, and creating a safe space where they have uh, support and peer activity. But then we also have an older youth who are looking to create space for youth in existing spaces uh, and are looking to create spaces in which all stakeholders are participating. So we've seen the structure has provided opportunities for youth, um, but also the perception of youth because of the large age range and uh, forgetting sometimes that youth doesn't necessarily mean youth newcomers. There has been a specific idea about what youth is and how they can be involved, but that hasn't deterred young people from creating their own spaces and providing each other with peer-to-peer -peer support. So to conclude, Young people who have chosen youth as their primary identity have used the IGF to create existing opportunities. And what our paper does is to shed light on the scope of what youth is um, and that they are aware of the limitations of the processes, but they are driven to create spaces for themselves. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask us about um, our paper or if you want to continue the discussion, we're happy to talk more about the way of different man uh, manners of participation at the IGF. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Nadia and Diana, and uh, thank you very much. So we will have a Q&A section in the end of the, all the five presentation, okay? So you can keep your question and ask it later. So now we, uh, uh, we give the time to our second speaker, and uh, that paper is about uh, politics of citation, agenda analysis of the conference proceeding, and it's from the Fernanda, Kimberly, Maria, and uh, Miro. So, yeah, uh, are you ready? Okay, now, okay, great. The time is yours. Awesome. All right, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Kimberly Anastasiu. I'm a PhD candidate at American University, presenting this paper that I've, I've written with Fernanda Rosa, Maria Vitoria de Jesus, 
and Emmanuel Veras, they are here with us in the audience today. Uh, the overall of this paper is to promote and inform debate on the politics of citation in internet governance, and we are focusing here on gender issues. Uh, in our study, we present the Bibliographic Reference Index, I'll call it BRI, that we developed to examine to what extent female and male names have been cited in papers that are published in the proceedings of the Internet Governance Research Network, Hedi, in Brazil, and I'll call it Hedi from now on too. So what is Hedi? Uh, Hedi is this academic uh, collective that started promoting conferences during the Brazilian IGF Day Zero, kind of like what you do here with Giganet in the global IGF. After the pandemic, we had two virtual meeting meetings detached from the Brazilian IGF. This November, we just had our fifth meeting. And for this paper, we are considering data from the previous four meetings, so between 2017 and 2020, excluding the year 2021, excluding 2020, where we didn't ho hold a conference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So here in the study, and as Hedi members, we recognize that citations are not just the basis of knowledge production and construction, but they are also technologies. And as technologies, they can be used as a tool to resist or augment the hierarchies of knowledge production that we have. And it's based on this idea that since our first meeting in 2017, Hedi has been collecting data for our bibliographic reference index, the BRI. This is a form that authors feel after they submit their final papers to the Hedges proceedings, answering questions about the nature of the citations of the papers that they have presented. So the form is filled by the authors themselves. And the idea is that this is a pedagogical content. So it's what theorists would call participatory action research in which by interacting with their own list of bibliographic references, authors that are participating in Hedi are expected to broaden their perception about their own theoretical production, their positionality as well. This means that in this paper, we are left to the author's own perception about what is a female and a male name. This points out to one main limitation of this study. We are not here talking about absolute terms on the data that represents people that identify women as men. So we don't capture the complexity, the nuance, the diversity of gender identities in our field. Uh, for instance, because of this narrow binary gaze of our method, we don't deal with the issue of trans women or men, as well as non-binary people in the citations. We focus instead then on talking only about names, the perceived female and male names instead of people. So now for our results, in Hedges proceedings, 16 articles were written by female names and 15 by male names. Four papers were co-authorship between female and male uh, names, independently of the order in which the names appear. And this means that our conference over the years had parity in who was presenting papers. When it comes to who was being cited, though, our results show that there is a preponderance of citations to uh, men, male names across the years. In the article, you can find a comparison dismissing the institutional citations, the citations to law or white papers and things like that. And we can also see that preponderance with slight increase in the citation of female names in more recent years, but still the disparity is there. We also examine whether there are differences in the female-male distribution based on the authors themselves. But there is also a preponderance of citations to male names, regardless of whether the authors have female or male names. We could maybe assume that female uh, name authorship would generate more citations for female names, but this did not happen. They actually cited numerically fewer female names. So, and this difference does not seem to be because male authors in the data set build larger bibliographic references. So to situate these results uh, among other issues on internet governance, we believe that some reasons for this result may be, may be the lack of knowledge of female bibliographic sources among female and male uh, names that were authoring the papers, maybe absence of bibliography in certain areas of internet governance of female names, maybe the reproduction of citation patterns from the past, 
maybe because we're following algorithms that highlight the most cited sources when you're selecting our bibliography, maybe even some lack of conscious engagement with bibliographic construction. But in any way, we see that this thing that we found in the Hages proceedings is part of a long-standing tendency that has been observed for a long time in many different fields from anthropology to communication, and a lot of references can be seen in our paper. And we know that one initial challenge for our results is that we cannot point out how many more female names could have been cited in order to achieve balance, because we don't have an established number of all the universe of names available, because internet governance researchers are spread across several different departments. And we also don't have an educational statistics that can allow us to measure the number of internet governance graduates, for instance. And also because uh, a lot of researchers working on internet governance do not even identify themselves as internet governance researchers. So to sort of understand how we can uh, situate the BRI, uh, we turned to uh, formational spaces. So there is a recent document formulated by the Internet Governance Forum that compiled the syllabi for some internet governance schools around the world. And it is, quote, unquote, a sample to give you an idea of the expertise and topics that are taught in academia and at schools related to internet governance. So we quantified the female and male names in the list of selected sources and faculty presented by the IGF, uh, just as the authors of the Hagee proceedings did for the BRI. And we found out that among the citations to sources of personal authorship, there is still a, a, there is still a predominance of male names. And this predominance is even more visible when we consider the list of, of fac faculty that is presented in the document. So experts with male names correspond to a value 71% higher than experts with female names. We also categorize this based on thematic modules on the syllabi, and you can see that on the paper. And critical internet resources has the fewer number of female names, whereas internet access and human rights, which includes teaching modules on gender issues, is the one with more parity, but still is just slightly. So to conclude, the idea behind the index is to contribute to the expansion of discussions regarding the presence of gender diversity in our field. Uh, and we received some comments from the authors who filled the BRI after presenting at the Hedge proceedings, and most of them reiterate what can be seen in this expert here. After filling out, it out, my first reaction was one of astonishment, considering the difference between the number of male and female authors in the article. Despite being aware of this gender issue in science, seeing this issue in the form of quantitative data shocked me. At the same time, as soon as I saw this data, I was thinking about the problem, how it would be possible to remedy. But I came across an issue that precedes the difference in number of citations in the article. I don't know enough female authors so that in the future, there is a balance in the number of citations. So based on our paper, uh, we are now uh, developing aims to promote greater reflection by the authors on their bibliographic references, shaping this action research process that I mentioned. So we are making available the translation of the BRI form in the paper. And we are also launching with the paper that we are presenting in GigaNet, a diversity statement that beginning this year, Hedge in Brazil will suggest that conference authors voluntarily including their papers for our proceedings. And it says, and it goes like this, and these are the numbers for the paper that we are presenting here. Through this declaration, we join a collective effort to undo the structural epistemological erasure in academia against women, non-binary people, Black people, people from the global South, and other social groups whose voices are less heard due to bias in citations. We believe that transparency in relation to our bibliographies is essential to understand the present and to change this structural condition in a joint and consistent way. In this paper, citations are distributed as follows. Females' names, 61%. Male names, 6%, female male names, 30%, institutional sources, 3%. So in internet governance schools, internet governance disciplines, internet governance conferences, we believe that they are fundamental spaces for intervention to the current gender gap in the field. And we hope that the results that we are presenting here will contribute to changes in that direction. And we thank you very much for this opportunity and for any comments and suggestions that you might have. So obrigada, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. We can see the power, you know, power between the female and the male uh, 
authorship uh, in your research. So yeah, uh, we saw already saw some questions for the authors, but as I said, we will take questions all together in the end of the five presentation. Okay, so you can either uh, type your question online in the chat box, or you just uh, keep it to the end of the sections. So now we pass the time to our third speaker, uh, Stephanie from the University of Geneva. Uh, her paper is on responsible behavior in cyberspace, engaging the private sector through tackle diplomacies. So Stephanie, and uh, we pass the time to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to share my presentation, but I'm not uh, enabled to. So with Zoom, you can I? Are you, uh, are you, do you are not able to share it. Can you share screen? No. No? No. Just a moment. Okay, just a moment. Uh, maybe I can send it. Um, just a moment, we will fix it, okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you. And can you try it now? You you should be yes. able to. Do you need? Can yes. You try? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Great. Time is yours. Perfect. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm Stefania Grotter, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Geneva. The paper I present today focuses on how the allocation of responsibilities for cybersecurity relies on politicized grounds, and more specifically, how this are established through political discourse, defining a new role for the private sector in providing security in cyberspace. Oops. To give you um, a quick overview of this presentation, I will briefly provide the context with where this research is framed, go into the research overview, looking at the research question and the hypothesis that I advance, and then I will highlight the research design and present the preliminary outcomes um, and findings before moving into, into the conclusions. Um, as you all know, the internet has become nowadays the backbone of our societies and, our, uh, and as a result, the more international social, political and economic relations rely on the internet, the more security studies look at its vulnerabilities. Um, a second aspect to consider is, that is what I call the cybersecurity challenge. Um, which has posed important challenges to the traditional conceptualization of security, um, from the identification of its referent objects to the provision of effective security management. Indeed, while cybersecurity is a strategic national and international priority for governments, um, they can hardly address the issue by themselves. And so a variety of new known state actors is required for their expertise, resources, and principles. And finally, another important issue to consider when discussing cybersecurity is the lack of agreed definitions. So different understandings of cybersecurity lead to different framings by relevant actors fostering their um, agenda setting objectives or frame policy strategies. So defining cyber cyberspace and defining cybersecurity creates a core production of roles and responsibilities. So in this paper, we argue that allocating cybersecurity responsibilities relies on politically connotated um, documents, which explain why the question of responsibilities in cybersecurity is still lacking in the, in the global governance literature. So uh, we advance the following question. How are cybersecurity responsibilities created um, in the political discourse? And to what extent is the role of the private sector implemented in the quest for responsible behavior in cyberspace? So we, um, to, to address this, uh, this research question, we rely on two main theoretical frameworks, uh, the securitization theory and the orchestration intermediary theory. The securitization theory explains um, how a security prior priority is formed and brought to the policymaking agenda. So it, it conceptualizes security as a way of establishing relations and relationships emerging from the responses of different actors to a security related threat. Um, this first theory helps, uh, helps us in understanding how cybersecurity narratives are advanced. Um, and through this narrative, we focus on the role of different actors in ensuring cybersecurity. So in this paper, we argue that the increase in cybersecurity moves um, by state leads to a higher relevance in cybersecurity as a frame policy uh, priority, as we would see in the hypothesis. The second theoretical framework is the orchestration intermediary theory, 
And according to this theory, an actor um, enlists and support intermediary actors to address a target um, in the pursuit of a governance goals. In other words, the orchestrator brings into the governance arrangements intermediaries instead of governing a target directly. What does it mean in practice? It means the states as orchestrators rely on intermediaries, um, in our case, the private sector, um, to, uh, to govern a target that in our case is, cyber, is the cybersecurity target. So to recap um, the overview of this research, we look at the definition of cybersecurity by three state actors, uh, our state actors in focus, and we focus on Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Canada. Um, <clears throat> then uh, we look at how they portray cybersecurity discussions as existential threats, um, leading towards the establishment of foreign policy priorities. And then we look at how, through the politicization of the debate, the cybersecurity discussion is securitized. And finally, we look at the emerging, at the emerging role of non-state actors in achieving the security goals. So on the basis of, uh, of the research question that I mentioned before, uh, we expect to see that the extent to which states engage diplomatically with the private sector varies with the establishment of cybersecurity as a foreign policy priority. So once again, in this paper, uh, we looked at Switzerland, Canada, and the Netherlands. We collected data, uh, and in terms of methodology, we collected data from national cybersecurity strategies, cybersecurity thematic studies, position papers, recommendation papers, and official press release, um, and complemented it with semi-structured elite interviews with diplomats from, from these countries. We then coded this document through text analysis to identify the grammar of existential threats. Um, and assess the degree of cybersecurity as a foreign policy priority. And finally, we look at the co-production of roles and responsibilities in the provision of security by focusing on, once again, the grammar of existential threat um, and uh, proposed by, by, by the states identified. So as you can see, I don't know if you can see it well with the video as well, uh, but as you can see from the table, there is no consistency in the identification of the existential threats. Uh, so each state tends to identify different elements showing how the securitization is based on, uh, on a politically connotated ground. And so if we, then, um, if we then look at the question of cybersecurity by which means, which builds um, on, the, on the security studies leading question of security by which means, we can see that states tend to recognize the role of the private sector and inevitably look at it as a necessary intermediary to achieve um, cybersecurity uh, related foreign policy priorities. So to sum it up and uh, to, to, to point out some, some preliminary outcomes, um, we can see that we have two major outcomes here, the emergence of non-state actors as securitizing actors um, and the need for orchestration. So, um, regarding the, the debate over cybersecurity, we see, get, we see that um, the emergence of non-state and non-military actors in a position to securitize a problem and influence whether or not the audience um, accept the associated security measures and what they entail. So in doing so, this links to, to, the, to the need for orchestration. Orchestration is an inevitable phenomenon um, in the governance of cybersecurity. Um, and, and we see that the states need, uh, the state need the, uh, the orchestration mechanism with the private sector to actually achieve their cybersecurity goal. Of course, um, further analysis is needed here um, on the role of state actors, on the legitimacy of, of, their, um, of their role in, in ensuring cybersecurity. And um, I think here we can see that there is, a, there is a lot of opportunity to study the emerging role on cyber and tech diplomacy um, and what it means in terms of engaging uh, non-state actors in achieving cybersecurity. So that's it from my side. I hope um, everything was clear, but I look uh, and I look forward to, to your questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephanie. S Stephanie, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, as we said, you know, this is a very uh, important area of research for, because the multi-stakeholder model of the IG, uh, the internet governance and uh, increasing importance of the non-stakeholder in the involving in the internet governance. So, and um, as I said, as I saw many of you are taking the pictures, you know, of, of, for the slides. Actually, I want to mention that all the papers of the presenta presentation actually are available on the GigaLab website. So if you go to the GigaLab website and you will see the symposium and also all the papers 
you can download from there. Okay, if you have any questions about uh, how to access to GigaLess website, you can come to talk to me after break. Okay, so and then we uh, thank you for Stephanie's the wonderful paper. So we uh, handed the uh, time to our fourth speaker from Sophia. So she's from the United Nations University, and uh, her presentation is on the role in the digital space symbolic interactions role theory and the norms of sovereignty. Okay, Sophia, we hand the time to you. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. My name is Sophia Hochemom, and uh, today I'm going to talk about my paper, uh, Roles in a Digital Space. Uh, I do have to give a slight warning from the start. Uh, my paper is slightly different than the ones that we've seen so far uh, today, given the fact that it's a very theoretical and conceptual paper. It's therefore also quite difficult to uh, properly explain uh, and uh, uh, to explain the entire argumentation in seven minutes. Um, I'm going to try to do my best. Uh, so first of all, the research puzzle um, that inspired me to write this paper was the fact that uh, I think today uh, we can see a lot of state and non-state actors that are trying to find a, a role, a suitable role for themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis or in the digital realm. And uh, on top of that, we also can see uh, a variety of users, uh, of actors using a discourse of digital sovereignty. Um, among which there are varying definitions uh, among the actors. And it was these two trends that um, are already mentioned uh, by a lot of other uh, academic articles. However, uh, I feel not many attempts to think about it in a theoretical or conceptual way, and um, also how to use that in research has been done so far. It was therefore that I um, tried to find um, theoretical approach uh, to these two phenomena. Um, and I looked into symbolic interactionist role theory to do so. Uh, before I can explain how I, um, how I use the theory in the digital realm, uh, it's important to uh, share with you a few of the basic uh, central concepts of the theory. Uh, the theory originates from the work of George Herbert Mead. He was a psychologist, sociologist, um, and he worked on the level, of the, uh, focused on the level of the individual, and he stated that every individual has a self, a sense of self, and that this is the product of social interaction. Uh, the sense of self also has an idea of role conceptions, uh, suitable role conceptions for itself. Uh, the self consists of the me, which is the ability for us to look at ourselves as an object, and the I, uh, who refer, which refers to the ability uh, of the individual to creatively respond to differences uh, and differences in expectations for the self. According to me, this often happens unconsciously. We are not aware of this. We live our lives until we are faced with a problematic situation, which directly challenges our perception of self or reality. Um, and it is because of this problematic situation that the self will go into a reflective mode uh, in which it will come to terms with the new reality and thinks of new uh, role conceptions that are suitable for this new reality. Uh, after the individual has done that, it will uh, engage in role-making processes, exercises, uh, in order to make the role. And a crucial part, so this is done by changes in behavior, changes in language, um, and also a crucial aspect of this is alter casting, which refers to the fact that if I want to have a specific role in a setting, uh, I need to cast the others that are also in that context into roles that are supportive of my uh, desired role. Uh, following the 1970s, these central concepts and ideas were transferred into the studies of international relations. And it's uh, in my paper that I uh, transfer and apply them to the digital. Uh, so in the paper, it's both a theoretical exploration of the ways in which the theory can help um, to understand. And I'm also and following that, I argue for using this uh, theory to conduct empirical research. Um, so I will briefly go into the theoretical exploration uh, because there's lots of aspects that I cover in my paper. But if we focus on uh, sovereignty from a symbolic interactionist role theory, sovereignty is understood as a collective meaning, which is the result of interaction, meaning that it's not a static concept. Uh, it only is there because people continue to give a shared meaning to it. 
Uh, it's therefore better suitable to talk about norms of sovereignty as the way that sovereignty is explained um, or certain characteristics change over time. So right now we would say the norms of sovereignty are often based on Westphalian understandings, but this is of course not fixed um, and this can change. Um, not only is sovereignty important on the world stage, um, it is very important in terms of different roles on the world stage. And this is also stated in the um, quote that you can find on the slide by Beasley, uh, who say that it's not only that they, that they establish and set parameters for the nature of agency and scope of acceptable behaviors for the sovereign role, meaning that on the world stage, not only sovereignty is an important concept for roles, but there also exists something that we can call the sovereign role. Well, on the basis of the theory, I argue in my paper that we can understand the uh, emergence of the digital realm as a, uh, not only understand, but approach it, um, the emergence of the digital realm as a problematic situation for all actors. Um, this not only because it's a new field in which actors need to engage, but also because the characteristics of this new field, the digital, uh, directly challenges current rule, ruling norms of sovereignty, as I said before, mostly Westphalian understandings such as territoriality and absolute authority. And this I uh, consider a problematic situation uh, because it impacts the idea of reality, the sovereign role, and therefore also role conceptions. If we follow the theoretical framework, uh, we would then expect actors to engage in a role-taking process in which they are imagining a role conception for themselves. And following this process, they will try to actively make this role uh, by behavior changes, this is, of course, when we refer to this theory to the level of states or uh, international organizations, this often comes in the forms of policy, um, strategic documents, and then there are changes in language, just, uh, a different discourse. And this brings me back to the, um, to the two aspects that uh, inspired my paper, uh, which is the concept of digital sovereignty. Um, on the basis of the theory, I argue that we should and can approach digital sovereignty as an important rule-making practice, given the fact that the current ruling norms of sovereignty, let's say the norms of sovereignty in the analog sphere, don't fully or are difficult to fully apply to the digital. And it's therefore uh, very, very important for actors, both states and non-state actors to either come up with new norms of sovereignty in the digital or to adapt uh, norms of sovereignty to the digital. Um, so it's therefore that I think that this conceptual scheme uh, on the basis of these central concepts, so I'm talking about rule taking, rule making, alter casting, uh, can be very um, useful, can be a very useful framework to conduct empirical research. And uh, I would say we could use this to look into individual actors by first identifying the specific problematic situation for them, then see how they engage in rule taking, how they engage in rule making, and then specifically how they engage with the concept of sovereignty, whether they avoid it, whether they explicitly mention it, whether they use a new discourse of digital sovereignty, et cetera. And then um, lastly, uh, to focus on alter costing processes, which is tied to uh, the role making exercise, because if I placed digital sovereignty at, uh, let's say, a regional level, um, explicitly and implicitly, I am called, uh, costing other actors such as the nation state in um, a less important role and a role that supports the desired role conception of a regional. Um, so to conclude, um, on the basis of my paper, or in my paper, I argue that uh, symbolic interactions role theory is very useful to further our understanding of roles in the digital space um, and how sovereignty relates to all of this. This, uh, given the fact that it can be used um, to uh, conduct empirical research of a specific actor and how they uh, position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the digital realm, but to also shed light on what I think is a social process that we are now witnessing in which uh, current uh, ruling norms of sovereignty are adopted or uh, even completely reconstructed to deal with the digital realm. And uh, here for I thank you all for listening and I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Uh, Sophia and uh, 
actually we're looking forward to read your paper because uh, in your short time uh, because there's only eight minutes for each presentation and we didn't see the uh, a lot of the the empirical uh, analysis because of the time restrictions but uh, we will mm -hmm. certainly you know read your paper to see how the this theory or this the framework analytical framework how do you apply it in your data analysis okay then the, that is very interesting approach as well so um, thank you Sophia again and then we pass the time to our last speaker so therefore they are uh, Kasania and uh, Francisca. And so their paper is on the safe space by design, fragile architecture as alternative social technological model for counter moderation governance. Okay, so uh, I don't know who will be the, uh, who will speak on behalf of both or both of you will speak. Yeah, I, yeah thank you, Yves Chan. Uh, I will be the one uh, presenting it, okay. uh, Francesca, yeah, we, uh, because uh, uh, Xenia is on. Senia is on a train right now, so she, she's here as far as I can tell, but uh, uh, from a train, so okay. <laughs> maybe not okay. the Okay, great. Francisca, so time is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, glad glad to be here among the, <laughs> the technical glitches, but I'm glad that we are all here with our uh, interesting uh, papers. It's great to, uh, to see you guys. Um, so uh, I'm going to say a few words about this uh, this paper, which is a very much a work in progress, given that uh, Xenia is uh, keeping on uh, doing interviews uh, for it uh, uh, on this very, <laughs> maybe at this very moment. <laughs> Uh, and uh, um, also because uh, it's a work in progress, also because uh, given to uh, given what uh, uh, Elon Musk has been doing with Twitter in the past uh, couple of weeks in particular, um, this uh, research about uh, alternatives uh, to uh, uh, federated alternatives uh, to uh, microblogging and the uh, secure messaging uh, platforms is actually of uh, uh, very much of actuality right now. So right now I'm going to present uh, uh, what we wrote in the work in progress paper that is available on the uh, on the GigaNet uh, website. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is very much uh, uh, going on <laughs> and going, and uh, uh, we hope to have updates soon. Uh, so. Uh, as, I, as I was mentioning, uh, this, this idea of uh, uh, using uh, federated uh, infrastructures, uh, federated architectures as uh, the basis of uh, uh, a number of communication platforms uh, nowadays, notably secure messaging, networking, microblogging, uh, is, uh, uh, it's a search for alternatives that is ongoing. Uh, why are, are they presented as alternatives? Because uh, so they are alternative on one hand to centralized applications applications that introduce a single point of failure in the network and lack operability, interoperability. And on the other hand, they are alternatives to purely decentralized peer-to-peer -peer apps that necessitate uh, higher levels of engagement, expertise, and responsibility from the users and from their devices. So decentralization, um, sorry, federation opens up uh, the core set of protocol designer and uh, involves a new kind of actor, which is the system administrator, responsible for maintaining the cluster of servers that are necessary for, uh, for federated networks. Uh, so there has been this, uh, this idea of uh, uh, migrating uh, from, uh, from centralized platforms and uh, the rise of this uh, Fediverse that is based on uh, feder federation uh, federative architectures. Uh, we have uh, Mastodon, we have Pleroma, PeerTube, and a number of other platforms that uh, are aimed at different use, but uh, share this, uh, this idea of, uh, of federated architectures. And uh, um, in the field of secure messaging, more precisely, that has been at the core of uh, uh, our research with Xenia for uh, uh, a few years now, especially in the frame of a uh, project called NextLeap, which is over by now, but we keep on uh, uh, pursuing this line of research. Uh, th there is a will to go against messaging uh, silos. So such as Matrix or Delta Chat, uh, have goals of uh, enhanced inter interoperability, security, and privacy. And uh, so we tried to do something with this paper uh, that we 
uh, touched upon in uh, uh, our book uh, about uh, secure messaging that was released in April uh, of this year, uh, we tried to look a little bit more closely at what federated architectures do for content moderation uh, and vice versa. And uh, we saw that, uh, well, this type of architectures introduce a number of challenges uh, for, for content moderation, uh, for content moderation practices. And as mentioned, this is a, a work in progress. Um, so what is federated moderation about? Um, federated social networks do introduce novel forms of content moderation, uh, reputation, uh, infrastructure maintenance, and uh, community involvement. They do so by uh, in a number of ways that involve uh, bots, relative reputation systems, uh, identity verification conducted in a decentralized manners, and um, something that is the subject of very much discussion, uh, machine learning type uh, solutions. So we delve more into uh, these, uh, these alternatives in, uh, in the paper. And uh, of course, these novel forms of content moderation also introduce uh, new controversies, uh, in particular, who holds the responsibility uh, for the control uh, for the content in a decentralized network and the control of this uh, of this content? Uh, one example of this controversy was uh, uh, the the ban of uh, the Matrix uh, uh, secure messaging tool from uh, Google Play uh, last year, uh, or the the use of uh, um, the Mastodon code by the controversial platform, uh, right-wing platform Gab, and so on. Uh, and uh, other controversies uh, are uh, about uh, identity verification uh, and, uh, and related uh, issues. Uh, so in this uh, in this paper we are uh, we uh, we have organized it around uh, the, its central part around two uh, case studies. One is Mastodon, so that has been hailed in very very recent days <laughs> uh, as a, as a possible alternative to uh, uh, to Twitter. Uh, so. Um, there are a number of, uh, of things that uh, we highlight in uh, in the paper about uh, about Mastodon. One is that uh, the user ratio uh, to uh, with respect to moderators uh, is uh, is very different uh, in such a platform. Facebook has uh, uh, seven thousand five hundred moderators for more than two billion users, uh, while in Mastodon it, it could be one to five hundred or one to five thousand. Uh, so we can see uh, uh, the difference. Uh, there is uh, a kind of a social centralization. So uh, uh, administrators and moderators are are vulnerable, and they are often very known by the community. So, uh, which is uh, quite unlike uh, with respect to Twitter or uh, or Facebook. And uh, th th there is a, a the. Uh, the moderator has a, a number of, of responsibilities that are not only more visible, but that are also more, uh, uh, that can be different with respect to, uh, uh, to centralized platforms. Uh, so there is a, um, uh, there has been a, a, an application programming interface that has been built in 2019 to allow third party tools to help uh, build solutions for service administrators that are dealing with spam and uh, with harassment. Uh, and uh, so, in uh, in the case of uh, of Matrix, uh, it is a uh, it is another uh, secure messaging uh, federated tool. So while uh, Mastodon is more like a micro microblogging platform, um, they have been uh, dealing uh, for a long time with uh, the reputation and abuse handling uh, problem, and there have been previous uh, controversies about it. So they have been trying to. Uh, implement uh, a number of, uh, of solutions that include uh, a support bot for bans, reductions, anti-spam, room shutdown, and so on. Uh, they have uh, implemented a, a relative reputation system that allows anyone to produce subjective scores on users, servers, rooms, or messages, uh, which is published as a reputation feed, and uh, users can combine these feeds uh, in, uh, in any ways to produce their own reputation scoring system. Uh, and uh, Matrix uh, has been looking to implement uh, uh, a principle of protocol neutrality uh, since its early days. Uh, so there is no moderation done on the protocol level, but instead there are uh, moderation policy lists uh, or ban lists, uh, which are stored as uh, room states. And uh, the, this is uh, uh, an example of this. Uh, and they can be shared across different rooms and servers uh, on the platform. 
Um, there have been discussion in in both uh, uh, for both of these tools about uh, machine learning uh, solutions. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm going to to go very very fast on this because uh, it's still uh, very much the subject of uh, uh, of discussion. And sometimes we can see how, uh, despite of all this discussion, uh, there is a, there is still a return to good old forms such as why do you want to join? Uh, this will help us review uh, your application. So to uh, to conclude, because uh, eight minutes are really short indeed. Uh, so in the conclusions, we have uh, uh, re uh, re um, arranged uh, and uh, updated uh, what we had called the uh, four C's of federation in uh, in the chapter ded dedicated to federation of our Concealing for Freedom book of, uh, this year, published this year. Uh, so we identified in that uh, in the conclusions to those chapters uh, to that chapter four uh, four keywords that happened to uh, to all uh, start with C in English. So we uh, we called it the four C's of federation uh, that uh, that are very important to uh, to start figuring out how federation uh, federated architectures uh, affect uh, platforms uh, and can be affected in return. So the first one is customization. Uh, moderation solutions are left on the implementation level and they do not affect the protocol itself. So this is uh, what uh, Matrix uh, calls protocol neutrality. Uh, the second C is compatibility. Uh, however, those solutions uh, are can be shared across uh, instances, and this is the strength of a uh, uh, of federation. Uh, there is a community dynamic. The reputation of the servers and the rooms is really collectively built, uh, quite quite so much as a living thing. And uh, codes of conduct are uh, continuously debated, and uh, in in that sense, the responsiveness of the administrator, the administrators of the different instances that compose the federation, uh, is is vital. Um, there is an aspect of uh, of care and maintenance. Uh, so moderation solutions are implemented without harming the infrastructure and the users. And the user, there are no back doors. And uh, so there is a fifth uh, honorary uh, C that we added uh, this time because indeed we observed that uh, there is an inherent risk for recentralization coming along with those solutions. So this is uh, also an old, uh, an old problem of uh, uh, partially or totally decentralized architectures that uh, re-intermediation and recentralization uh, is, uh, is always there and uh, uh, subject to coming back into the picture. And uh, uh, we have to see uh, the, the extent to which uh, uh, it, is, it is possible and it is actually happening, uh, the, these dynamics of uh, recentralization. So this is it, and uh, maybe there will be some questions. Uh, looking forward to it, and uh, uh, possibly Xenia will chime in as well. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Francisca and uh, Kasania. So now we have all uh, five presentations done, uh, finished. So now we are giving our time to our discussions, and uh, from the Aiden and Vadania, uh, and uh, he is from a Humanity in Actions. So please come here, come forward to our stage. And uh, so, yeah, uh, time's yours. Can you share your thoughts and give some comments to our speakers? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Aidan Vaudelin. I am a Landaka Democracy Fellow with Humanity in Action and the Landaka Democracy Foundation. And firstly, thank you so much for all of your presentations today. These have been really interesting. I was brought in as a discussant at the last minute, so I haven't had the chance to dive into your papers to the extent that I wish I could, but I certainly did read all of them, and I learned a lot from all of you. And regardless, I hope that my comments can still be helpful. And what I certainly hope is not the case is that I become one of those discussants that you might recognize that doesn't know what they're talking about and hasn't read the papers properly. If that is me, take my comments with a grain of salt. Hopefully, I'm <laughs> uh, able to offer some comments that will be very helpful. So firstly, I appreciate that all of the papers came together to discuss the composition 
of who is engaging in the agenda setting and decision making processes pertaining to core internet infrastructure. You approach this topic from very different perspectives and that's understandable of course. Uh, some papers were more theoretical, some were more oriented towards practitioners. However, this is a very important field of study and all of your papers offer a rich contribution to the field. I will provide a few individual comments first on each paper and I'll present these thoughts in the order of the presentations that we just heard today. So to the, the first presentation by Nadia and Diana, uh, Nadia, hi, <laughs> firstly, um, great to see you again. And this is a paper that is very near and dear to me. I followed your earlier research on this topic with interest and was pleased to see you explore what you term youth meta-participation. Not a concept I had heard before, but uh, really an intriguing one. And a very difficult subject because, as you no doubt know, um, youth is such a broad category. It encompasses so many different voices. So it's, in general, really difficult to do this topic justice. That being said, I think it might have been interesting if you had also interviewed non-youth participants. I understand why you gave voice to youth, it makes a lot of sense, but what are the perceptions that non-youth stakeholders have of youth participation? That could be an interesting angle to go down in the future. I also thought, and I don't mean this as a criticism, that the IGF might have been one of the less interesting venues for you to explore youth meta-participation within. The IGF, as we all know, we're here, wonderful space, but it is a bit of a talking shop. Uh, Decision-making processes don't necessarily result out of what happens at the IGF, and I appreciate that what I'm about to say is an anecdote, but some people don't participate in this space because there are other fora where they feel like they can have more of an impact and can be more, um, can punch above their weight, if you will. So perhaps it could have been interesting to think of a comparative perspective, youth and the IGF, youth and ICANN, youth and other institutions, to understand are there different spaces where youth are making space for themselves, where they are potentially having different levels of impact, and why is that the case? Again, great work, and please take these comments in good faith. To the next paper um, that was presented by Kimberly, um, along with Fernanda, Maria, and Emmanuel. Um, first, again, really important work, great topic. Um, thank you for your research here. I was wondering, and I, and I wasn't sure if you had explored it or to what extent perhaps you had explored it. When you, um, so, so we're talking here about um, citations and gender gaps in citations and research. To what extent do men potentially self-cite themselves in their own papers? And to what extent does this potentially perpetuate some of the citation gaps that you're seeing? I realize this is an anecdote, but uh, I have read the work of a lot of the scholars that you cited in one of the footnotes, and people do sometimes cite themselves. <laughs> and there are legitimate reasons for doing that. You don't want to be accused of self-plagiarism, et cetera. But it could be interesting just to think about, is self-citation also a factor here that we need to uh, think about? Now, turning back to the substance of your paper, I like that you explored the syllabus that the IGF Secretariat commissioned to inform schools of internet governance about how local communities can teach uh, how critical internet resources are managed. There is definitely a gender gap or a citation gender gap that you highlight in your work and, and of course unacceptable. I guess a piece of the puzzle that I thought was missing was remedies. How do we fix this gap without putting the burden on traditionally excluded communities to do more labor trying to draw attention to this problem. Curious how you think we can go about trying to um, resolve this tension. 
the next paper, um, Stefania, so Stefania, your article introduced the concept of orchestration as a model of indirect governance that supplements delegation models premised, which are premised, of course, on principal agent theory. I haven't seen this theory referenced before, the theory that you relied on, I haven't seen it referenced before in the literature, but I think that it makes sense. And so in that sense, it is, of course, a new contribution to the field. And I think that the theory does accurately describe the non-hierarchical relationship between the orchestrator, the principal, and the intermediary, the agent. I find the idea of a comparative perspective between countries interesting. However, I couldn't work out from your paper why you chose Canada, the Netherlands, and Switzerland to examine. I'm not sure if there's a personal connection. I'm not sure if it was ease of being able to access elites for interviews, whether it was because of um, documents being available, or maybe there's another rationale altogether. That was something that I thought was just missing from the paper, the justification for why the three countries were chosen. I also thought that the sample size of interviews was on the smaller side, and that interviewing more people, particularly from the private sector, would have been interesting given that the paper was really, um, uh, as the title of the paper would suggest, has a bit of a focus on the private sector. So um, two interviews seem to me not quite enough. And while I understand the justification for offering anonymity to the people who were interviewed, it made it difficult for me to assess their credibility for the comments that they offered. What is the size of the tech company that they represent? Is it a large tech company, small, mid-sized? Uh, what jurisdiction is it based in? What are their responsibilities? Are they on a public policy team, et cetera? So I thought there needed to be a little more of a justification as to how the interview um, subjects were chosen. And I hate to end on a negative note, so please take these comments in good faith and great work. Sophie, um, so you presented a theoretical explanation of the way in which roles in the digital space and the position of the notion of sovereignty can be understood. I thought this was a really strong and convincing paper. Um, of course, it was accepted to this conference, so it would be strong and convincing, <laughs> like all of our papers here today. Um, so I guess my only comment is really to link it back to um, Fernanda, Kimberly, Maria, and Emmanuel's paper and to ask whether there were additional references or scholars who should be cited. Just my sort of cursory look at the names that were cited. I don't know, maybe there are some, maybe there are some missing voices. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll leave it to you to uh, look into that and to see whether there might be some different perspectives that could be brought into your excellent work. And then finally, um, is, it, is it Senia? Um, you obviously, and, and you are aware of this because you mentioned it, it is a uh, piece of work that is evolving because uh, Mastodon has been growing in relevance over the past few weeks, sort of the aftermath of Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter. So um, no doubt that is changing um, some of the conclusions that you were drawing upon in your work. So it could be interesting to explore now that Mastodon has gone a little more mainstream, the frustrations and challenges that these users are facing, as well as some other protocols that are emerging. I'm thinking the Blue Sky Initiative, the authent authenticated uh, transfer protocol as well. Um, some other standards trying to bring about interoperability. You did a really good job, I thought, at highlighting the challenges that these decentralized federated networks face. But then the conclusion I found a little unconvincing. Are they really, as you put it, promising alternatives when they have so many flaws which you identify in your paper? Um, they might well be. <laughs> I would just like to sort of see a bit more information as to why these are so promising. 
I'd like to stop here and to give the floor to our moderator, but thank you again for your work. Thank you so much for your considered opinions, and I'm sure our discussants would love to respond to them because it was a critical engagement, but um, I'm afraid we're running terribly over time, and um, apologies for just stepping in. Um, my name's Alison Gilwald, and I was moderating the previous session, and Yik, has had to, um, Yik Chen has had to step out. So, um, Roxana, I just wanted to check if we have time for any of those online questions. I know there were some, or um, are there any from the floor? Roxana, are there... Are there any two that we can take um, very quickly? I know we're now very, getting close to very uh, 15 minutes over time. Yeah, absolutely. We have uh, two questions that came in. Uh, both are for Kimberly. What reliability assurance measures were taken uh, into account in the assignment of gender to names? And the second one, are the citations counted in the analysis referring only to the HEDE uh, publications or all of the literature cited in uh, HEDE publications? There was an additional comment from Berna um, talking about uh, <clears throat> the assignment of gender to names, which would be certainly difficult in Turkish as well. Uh, so this is all from, uh, from the online um, uh, room. And if there are any questions on the floor um, over there, maybe we can take all of them together and hand back to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxana. So there are no questions from the room. So if we can go immediately back to the um, online questions, please, and the online answers. I suggest we start with Kimberly, but then we give a chance to everyone to respond to Aidan's comments. All right. Um, thank you very much for the questions and the comments. I'll try answering first the the question on Zoom. Um, first, about the reliability of the measures taken for the assignment of gender to the names. We definitely believe this is a tricky issue. But for the part where we talk about the BRI results, the authors of the paper the papers presented at the Hague proceedings themselves were responsible for quantifying the female and male names. So we have no control over the research process as part of the participatory research action methodology that we used. So the authors themselves do the quantification in order to foster their reflection on what they wrote. Uh, one of the equivalents of the APA citation standard that it's used mainly in the US, but in Europe sometimes too, uh, in Brazil, puts most of the site, the references with the first and last name. And we believe that Hedge authors mostly use that to label female and male names, especially because in Brazil names tend to have a feminine and masculine form, so they are gendered. Um, for the part where we talk about the IGF syllabi document, we quantified the citations ourselves, and we used the, our own understanding of what was a female and male name. And unfortunately, we turned to searches for the author's pictures to label them as female or male names when we couldn't identify promptly uh, a female and male name based on their the names themselves. Uh, we discussed the limitations of these methods and this binary gaze in our paper, which due to the difficulty to analyze this type of data has been a method that is used in other papers as well that discuss gender and citations in other fields too. As for the qu second question, if the citations counted in the analysis refer only to Hage publications, all the literature cited, the citations that we used in this data set uh, are all the reference lists in the papers that were presented in Hage conferences over the years. So if you think about GigaNet, it is like if we had analyzed all the papers presented and published in GigaNet's proceedings using their references list in the end of the papers. Um, as for the comments, uh, I thank you very much, especially the question about the remedies. And because the, we as authors of this paper are also members of the organizing committee for HEGI, the GigaNet equivalent, if, as to say, uh, in Brazil, we are using the BRI as one intervention and one remedy because we believe that by making our authors consider the, their own citations, maybe we can foster change and bring more balance over the years. Now we will analyze, now that we will include the, the, 
statement, a diversity statement. Maybe we'll see across the years some changes. That's what we expect, but that's our main intervention now. And as for the self-citation things, we definitely believe that this is something that is important. It's a bit out of scope for this paper now, but maybe for future studies, it's something that we should definitely consider. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm wondering if anybody would like to um, add a response to Aidan very quickly. I think we are 15 minutes over time, but we can try to squeeze everything into the next uh, two minutes. So if anybody has a burning uh, a question or answer uh, back to Aidan, please feel free to um, to step in. Yeah, maybe I would start if that's okay. Um, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, just a quick response to um, to your question. Uh, in my case, the the selection of the count of the of the three count countries was done on a proposed sampling uh, basis, and the reason is uh, yes for ease of data collection, also because uh, no no previous studies were available before, so I had quite a flexibility in the in the decision of in the in the choice of the countries. And uh, regarding the interviews, um, I fully take your point. Uh, just one quick response is that the interviews were complementary data collection. So the analysis was done, done mainly on the interviews, but they complemented a little bit uh, the picture that cannot be grasped from the documents. But uh, definitely, if this is a starting point, then for next, uh, for follow up, uh, you know, papers for sure, I'm going to go more, um, I'm going to build more interviews and, and more data on that. So thank you very much for that. Um, and um, yeah, thank you for, for this incredible discussion. Thanks. Um, if I may then. Um, hi, Aiden. Thank you so much for your comments. And I really appreciate that you had the time to look at everything and also um, share your thoughts. I I know that the, the IGF is at the moment, a really exciting opportunity, in my opinion, because a lot of things are changing about the manners and processes the IGF is developing in. And with WESIS uh, plus 20 coming up, it would be interesting to see how youth are in these spaces and with the Secretary General wanting to emphasize youth participation, to bring that all together and having something to work from and moving towards. Uh, I then love your idea about then moving that forward and looking then how that works into the other institutions. If you're thinking about ICANN, maybe also the ITU, um, how kind of the interconnections then can further develop will be absolutely something that I would love to do for a postdoc. So um, thank you so much for the suggestions, something definitely to consider. And um, I really appreciate the time you've taken for this. Have a great time in Ethiopia. I'm wondering if Francesca might want to comment very quickly on the value of federated architectures and the promise. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I, as a, as you asked, I was a, I replied to to Fernanda in the, in the chat to to her specific question. Uh, as for um, so I, I will just say a thing very quickly about the the promise in in the promising alternatives. I think that there is uh, there is one thing that uh, is particularly uh, useful to explore in this type of of arrangements. Uh, and uh, we can see it very much with the mask controversy right now, which is the fact that uh, instances in, in federated architectures uh, allow uh, users to have different degrees of um, autonomy and the technological expertise and, uh, uh, and at the same time are able to uh, enable them to uh, to choose an instance that has uh, uh, values uh, and uh, uh, terms of uh, conditions uh, to, to use uh, and the privacy protection and so on that are uh, closest as possible to their own values. And so well, I think that this is the, the true potential advantage of federated architecture vis-a-vis -vis, uh, centralized ones and also purely decentralized ones that uh, they offer different levels of uh, possible expertise and uh, uh, adherence to specific values that uh, users can uh, can explore so yeah this is also why as somebody was saying in twitter uh, right now we're uh, uh, discussing this uh, what's going on in this panel right now uh, that uh, uh, choosing the server is important uh, when uh, when uh, joining mastodon and this is exactly it. it's like it's choosing the right instance for you thank you Thank you all very much. Uh, I realize we've run over time massively. 
I'd like to thank once more to all our presenters and participants. It has been a fascinating discussion, and I hope we can continue this conversation uh, over uh, lunch break, uh, if you're physically present or uh, some of it online here or into our next panel. Uh, thank you once more. Apologies for, for running late and enjoy your lunch break. Thank you so much, thank Roxana. You so much. Um, thank you very much, Aidan. Um, sorry we didn't get a chance for more discussion after that. Thank you so much to all of you who've um, borne with us running over. And please, for those of you who are joining us, be back at uh, 2 o'clock so we can try and keep these sessions on time for the people online. Thank you so much for your participation.